morning. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. Uh, we're glad to, you are here. We are welcome to all those on Zoom. Um, Pastor Vicki is on her way. She's a bit under the weather, but she's going to be making it and doing Zoom from her office this morning. Um, but in the meantime, we'll do some announcements. Um, today is our annual meeting. Um, those of you who are present, we hope you will stay. If you're a member, you will be a voting. You will be voting on some issues that I hope you um, prepared for, reading them in the good uh, uh, information in the good news. If you are not a member, you can stay anyway um, and and hear about our church and our plans. Um, also, there's going to be an ice cream uh, social in the parking lot after church. Is that is that right? Are we still doing that? Okay, great. Um, Sunday school begins today. Yay! And this, um, Judy and Jenny are looking for folks who would like to share their faith journey um, with the fourth through eighth graders. So please contact them if you have an interest in sharing and get a little more information on what they're looking for. Uh, the Nagemba House Project continues and they're looking for some help on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Painters are needed this week. Subfloor and window trim the following week and then some flooring. Uh, contact John Avancic, George, Bob, uh, Lewis, for more information, look in the good news, you can get contact information there. Our Allies for Justice program continues. We have a monthly third Thursday evening chat discussion. Um, this month, we will be talking about the disparities in our criminal justice system. There are some links to some articles you may want to look at just for some background information, or you may want to do some of your own research and come to the meeting to have a chat about how we can respond to some of these concerns as Christians. We also will have a book discussion, the uh, book discussion, the first date. I'm not sure how many we're going to have yet. Depends on how this, how, how we can get through this book. It's a wonderful book, but it's kind of, um, it's rich in content. Um, it's called White Too Long by uh, Robert P. Jones. And the first book discussion will be on October 9th, so that gives you some time here to get started in the reading. Next Sunday, Confirmation Sunday, where we will hear our confirmant statements of faith and also celebrate their journey in this faith. Our adult Bible study will begin anew next Sunday, 9.15, also Monday evening at 7 o'clock, same, same um, content. Um, we will be talking about the language of Christianity following some of the content of a book by Marcus Borg called Speaking Christian. Next Sunday is also the book discussion following worship. And tell me the name again. Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. It was a very good book. And now as we enter our time of worship. On September 11th, 2001, John Thomas, then president and general minister of the United Church of Christ, was in Germany visiting our ministry partners there. Reflecting on his experience of these chaotic days in Germany and the ones following his return to the US, Thomas recalls the failure of churches to respond prophetically, not only to the deeds against our nation that day, but also to the jingoistic and militaristic response that followed. Speaking at General Synod in 2007, he lamented, we confess that too often the church has been little more than a silent witness to evil deeds. We have prayed without protest. We have been more afraid of conflict in our churches than outraged over the deceptions that have killed thousands. We have confused patriotism with self-interest. As citizens of this land, we have been made complicit in the bloodshed and the cries. Lord, have mercy upon us. 20 years after that fateful day, too often our churches continue to stand silent in the face of oppression and violence. We are more concerned about the number of members in our pews and the balance in our budget than we are in following the teachings of Jesus, 
to speak out for justice. On this day of our annual meeting, we will commit to being, will we commit to being a faithful and prophetic congregation or will we remain silent in the face of inequity simply to keep our coffers and our pews full? As we struggle to find our way back from a global pandemic, we have a chance to define the kind of church we want to be and how we will move ahead. Will we be guided by the teachings of Jesus and the word of God or by the siren call of our culture to meet its measures of success? Please, ri please rise as you are able for the call to worship. Come if you have a weak faith or you are convinced in the strength of your convictions. Come so that you might be strengthened and challenged. Lead us into life, O oh God. Come if you are chased by the demands of others or if you feel threatened by a loss of security. Come so that you might be strengthened and challenged. Lead us into life, O oh God. Come if you need forgiveness or if you need strength to forgive others. Come so that you might be strengthened and challenged. Come, let us worship the Lord, whose grace and love know no end. Join us in the opening hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead. Jesus, uh, please be seated.
Join in our prayer of confession. Jesus challenges us to seek forgiveness for ourselves and to forgive those who have sinned against us. So together, let us pray. Holy God, when we seek security only in military and economic forces and not in knowledge of your presence, when we become concerned with our well-being only and so fail to see the consequences of our choices upon the lives of others, forgive our narrow worldview. Open our eyes to see others as persons with whom we are connected in the web of life. When we rejoice in the downfall and defeat of our enemies, forgive our misplaced loyalties. Open our hearts to see our enemies as our sisters and brothers in your family. When we fail to forgive others and allow ourselves to be caught in the mire of grudges held, forgive our rancor and open us to reconciliation. When we are faced with a sea of trouble, whether of our own making or cast upon us by the action of others, part the waters of regret and revenge that lead us onto the dry grounds of forgiveness. God is compassionate and does not deal us according to our sins, but cast them as far away from us as the East is from the West. Free of the mistakes of the past, we can begin again. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalms 27, selected verses. This morning's psalm is an individual lament that invites reflections about the activity of God and where God might be discerned. Listen to the psalmist's words of discernment. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, 
and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth destruction, and the word of God from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God. But we will walk in the name of our God forever in heaven. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. And finally, contemporary reading. This from the book, Ten Years After the Letters and Papers from Prison, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In the 1930s, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor in the Confessing Church who refused to profess allegiance to the Nazi regime, as most of his peers did. In December of 1942, he wrote a letter to his friends, sharing his struggle with his desire to end Hitler's reign, while also fighting against the human temptation to build a resistance movement from the contempt he felt rather than out of a concern for those who were suffering. Listen to his words from the letter he wrote. We have been silent witnesses to evil deeds. We have become cunning, and we have learned the arts of obfuscation and equivocal speech. Ex experience has rendered us suspicious of human beings, and often we have failed to speak to them a true and open word. Unbearable conflicts have worn us down or even made us cynical. Are they still of any use? Geniuses, cynics, people who feel contempt for others or coming technicians are not what we need, but simple, uncomplicated, and honest human beings. Will our inner strength to resist what has been forced on us remain strong enough and our honesty with ourselves blunt enough to find our way back to simplicity and honesty and honesty. Good morning. First, I want to make sure that you are hearing me because we're doing this in a whole new way. Would a couple of people on Zoom please just put a message in the chat if you can hear me. And if you're not, good morning. Oh. Okay, there we go. Uh, great. And I hope everyone in the sanctuary can hear. If there's a problem in the sanctuary, Sue, would you come in and let me know? Friends, I am broadcasting from my office because I had a COVID test a couple of days ago and have not yet gotten results. I hope that being careful. And so the May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Much like you, I was amazed on 20 years ago. Anyone who is an who is listening I'm sorry, folks in the sanctuary, we just lost our Zoom connection and I'm waiting to get that back. You can bear with me for just a moment.
If you are like me, I'm guessing that you were amazed yesterday that the sky looked exactly as it did on that fateful day 20 years ago. Anyone who is an adult here, even someone as young as 22, likely remembers exactly where they were when they heard the news of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and of the plane crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And we remember those horrific images of a plane fl planes flying into buildings and then those buildings collapsing. It's also likely that you saw the multiple news programs over the last many days that have reflected on the events of that day. They still bring tears to our eyes even now. And I'm waiting for the internet again. I am so sorry. The devastation was overwhelming, almost beyond comprehension. And we all needed time to process what we had witnessed. Of course, it's important on this anniversary that we acknowledge the first responders and those who lost others that they loved so dearly. But we also need to acknowledge the problem that arose in our response after those early days had gone by, our response over the long term. And so this morning, I'd like to focus on the response of the church, then and now. The lessons that we can learn can be learned from the responses of the German churches during the rise of Nazism in the 1930s. Hitler sought allegiance from churches, and most of them gave it to him a small number resisted, including Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was one of a number of pastors who in 1934 were part of the creation of the Theological De De Declaration of Barman, which refused to make the church subjugated by the state. The sculpture, which can be found in the lobby of the Evangelical Church of the Rhineland in Dusseldorf, shows how many, many people raising their arms in salute to the Nazis, while a small group at the back has turned away and gathered around the Bible. It reminds those who view it of the seduction facing the church and the need to remain faithful in the face of cultural and economic idolatries. That declaration led Bonhoeffer to write the words that West just shared, including the sentence, are we still of any use? Recently, John Thomas, who was president and general minister of the United Church of Christ in 2001, wrote a compelling reflection of his memories of September 11th. As I read it, Bonhoeffer's question haunted me. As news reports and documentaries recalling the events of that fateful day make clear, Americans' immediate response was unity, a pulling together, and gratitude to first responders. It set hordes of people pouring into churches. In fact, I recall attending a number of services in those days immediately following and there were often standing room only crowds. And yet, in just a matter of weeks, those crowds disappeared. Perhaps it was because people were disappointed by the lack of response of the churches. In the days following September 11th, our country was gripped by a sense of hyper-nationalism that was rampant everywhere. In fact, even, 
our churches were festooned with American flags and God bless America was the soundtrack for every event. Now, some of you may be saying, well, what's wrong with that? Our country had just been attacked. Of course, we responded with patriotism. And that's not surprising on many levels, but if we are to respond guided by our faith and by the teaching of Jesus, of what it means to seek the realm of God, does a nationalistic response make any sense? As Thomas points out, a faithful response would note violence like this happens almost daily to many vulnerable people in the world. Our faith compels us to be drawn into deeper sympathy and solidarity with marginalized folks, rather than seeking And yet, the administration proposed a war against an axis of evil. Congress nearly unanimously supported it, and almost every church in this country also went along without any kind of critical reflection. Even in churches like the United Church of Christ, long committed to peace and justice, too many churches were silent on the misgivings of vengeful responses and chose instead to focus on pastoral concerns rather than speaking out prophetically. Those few who did risk a prophetic response often found themselves met with stony silence, if not angry dissent. Reflecting now from the vantage point of 20 years of history, Bonhoeffer's question still, still taunts us. Are we still of any use? More than 7,000 soldiers have been killed in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and 30,000 more have committed suicide since returning home. Hundreds of thousands of civilians have been killed, and trillions of dollars were spent on those wars, dollars that could have been used for education and upgrading our healthcare system, which might have helped to save lives during our current pandemic. As all of this played out, churches were at best silent witnesses to what was happening and too often served as cheerleaders. So what might we have done differently? How can we be of use today? Taking our lead from the German Christians who pledged to the Barman Declaration, we can let our faith shape our thinking rather than following a blind allegiance to the state. Instead, we can recall that as Christians, our allegiance is to the world and the teachings of Jesus. We can seek our common humanity with those who are victims of violence each day and work to put an end to hostile responses. And we can accept that peacemaking always carries a cost and we can find the courage to bear it. It may not be surprising that so many of us responded as we did since we were raised in an age when church and state were so closely aligned. Yet in his insightful reflection, Thomas talks about two different occasions where the response of young people he encountered in Germany in the days immediately following September 11 caused him pause. He notes that they had come of age during the heady optimism at the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany following the fall of the Berlin Wall. So this was likely their first encounter with the reality that evil had not yet been fully vanquished. With their youthful optimism shaken, Thomas posits that they came looking for a secure place to plant their hope. Did we let them and did we let other young people down? It seems so, and it may account for the dearth of young people in our own churches today. 
writing last year in The Atlantic, Ben Rhodes, a former deputy national security advisor in the Obama administration, references a class he taught in 2019 at UCLA on presidential rhetoric and American foreign policy. He was stunned when, after giving his students Bush's address to Congress following September 11th, a speech that he found deeply moving. His students couldn't believe that the nation's purpose had been focused on a war against a group of terrorists rather than on climate change, economic inequality, and structural racism. They were completely unmoved by the speech. Never forget has been the overarching message of the 20th anniversary of the horrific events of September 11th, 2001. It's a very important message. We should never forget the acts of heroism, the sacrifice that so many made that day, and the sense of unity that brought our nation together in the days that followed. But we can also never forget our purpose as a church, to share the good news of God's realm, to be agents of peace who, as our text from the prophet Micah says, shall not lift up sword against another nation and shall not learn war anymore. We cannot let the cultural measures of success like the number of people in our pews or the number of dollars in our coffers define who we are as people of faith. Are we still of any use? My prayer, my friends, is that we will choose to be so by exercising courage to trust in God's promise of peace with justice and to be agents to bring it to reality. On the day of our annual meeting, as we set a course for our next year, may that be our guiding purpose. May we be of use in the year to come. Amen.
Friends, Sue, Sue will gather any joys and concerns that you have in the sanctuary, and then I will follow with sharing a number that I have. Sue? Any joys and concerns you have to share today? There's one I have. It was a joy to have the organ back. Oh, and thank you, Jared, for using it as part of our worship experience today. It was wonderful to have it. It's been, I don't know if those of you who know this was broken, but it was fixed this week, so we're very grateful for that. Are there any other joys and concerns from the sanctuary here? Okay, back to you, Vicki. Oh, I'm sorry. There is one. Thank you. Where? Oh, First of all, Carolyn. Hold on, Vicki. Carolyn has a, 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 a prayer request. Hold on, Vicki. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, that was a message from Russ Lianza who was going to be with us this morning as for our annual meeting. He is our treasurer and it was going to be voted in again as our treasurer. Um, but he lets us know that his Janice's father is critically ill with COVID and just learned from the doctor that it doesn't look good and the family is gathering, was gathering at 9.30 this morning. Um, prayers for the Lianza family um, in these very difficult times. Okay, Vicki, I think that's it. Back to you. And yes, um, I've been texting with Janice all week. They moved her father to comfort care overnight um, because he is so ill. And I think are finding a sense of peace knowing that given his frail health before COVID, it would be a very difficult recovery. And so our prayers surround the Lianza family who have just barely gotten back on their feet following uh, the struggles and difficult situation they went through with Kyle last month. Please hold them in your prayers. I want to begin by thanking all of you for your prayers and cards following uh, the death of Mike's brother two weeks ago. It was a hard loss, but your, your prayers have been very, very helpful. The Delta variant, sadly, is striking extremely close to our congregation right now. Excuse me. <coughs> and we have, um, as, as I think Sue has shared, I have, hoping just a bug, but because I was at a funeral last week with lots of people who uh, weren't necessarily masked and don't know their vaccination status, I had a test and I'm waiting results. Allison and Emily Lehman are just finishing their quarantine and are still struggling with being exceedingly tired after having had COVID. As I mentioned, Janice's dad is very ill at Southwest Hospital with it, and Patty Skavoritz has also been very, very sick this week um, with COVID and is beginning uh, to be on the mend. Patty's father, John Ginder, to complicate matters for her, just came home from the hospital where he was diagnosed with heart arrhythmia problems and Patty is heartbroken that with COVID she is not able to see him. So please hold not only Patty, but her father and her entire family in your prayers. Allison Lehman's father is also dealing with health issues. He's in extreme pain in his back because of a hereditary condition, and Allison would appreciate prayers for her father, John. 
We continue prayers for Judy Van Auken and Dolores Astor, who are in hospice care, for Alan and Kathy Blessinger, and for Jim and Jackie Mayer. It's been a difficult time for so many in our congregation. Thank you for your continued concern and prayer. Let's begin our time of conversation with God this morning with an extended period of silence as we reflect not only on the large number of prayer concerns we have, but on the events that we re remember this weekend. Let us be at a time of prayer. God of all races, nations, and religions, you created all of us in your image. Yet on this day, we remember that there are those who have distorted your image, seeking power for themselves instead of trusting in yours, destroying relationships with violence, fear, and oppression, rather than seeking to build them up through love, peace, and mercy. In this time of worship, we recall that you guide us to create rather than destroy, to love, not hate, to build instead of tearing down, to reconcile rather than break apart, and to seek restorative justice instead of revenge. On this 20th anniversary of the day of death and destruction, we have vowed never to forget. And so we recall as we recall the dust and smoke, the despair and grief, the vulnerability and shock, and the overwhelming numbness. We recall the words of support and compassion from nations far and wide. We remember the heroes who rushed in to help and who fought back against those who held death in their hands. May their courage be to us a witness of what is possible when we are guided by love and dedication to our fellow human beings. We pray today that your spirit will breathe new breath into clouded lungs, new life into troubled minds, and new warmth into broken hearts, so that all may feel wrapped in your loving embrace. As we reflect, we grieve our inability to learn the things that lead to peace but we gather in worship to remember that we are created in your image, to be creative beings in this world, and to recall that we follow Jesus who went to the cross instead of seeking revenge, who walked the earth in peace instead of carrying weapons, and who in the resurrection comes and says, peace be with you. Inspire us with hope in the gift of shalom. Enable us to be instruments of your peace in this world so that all people may know that they are equally loved and lovingly created children of God. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. First, I want to just take a moment to tell you, tell, I've just tell, received tell, word tell, from tell, Allison tell, that her and Emily's um, quarantine, quarantine is over. They, they are, are at church today. today. She, she doesn't, doesn't want anyone, anyone to be afraid to be around him, around them. them. Their quarantine ended, ended a couple of days ago. So I apologize, Allison, for that confusion. 
as we approach the end of the fiscal year, we encourage you to experience the gift of generosity, which can bring joy and peace. So please fulfill your pledge so that we can end our year strong, because your practice of generosity enables our ministry. Thank you for sharing your gifts online whenever possible, or by placing them in the box as you leave the sanctuary, or sending them through the mail. Will you join us now, rising as you are able, in our closing hymn, Be Still My Soul? Go forth now, strengthened to do the work of Jesus, sharing peace with justice, offering forgiveness in building community, and inviting others to embark on the journey into abundant life for all. Know that God who created you, the Christ who redeems you, and the Spirit who empowers you will be with you this day and always. Amen. I invite you now to remain seated in the sanctuary and to remain on Zoom for our annual meeting, which will begin momentarily.